started, even though there's no one around. <laughs> Well, not literally no one. I did have to, I got I one like that this quarter in the other class, but there was literally no one there. <laughs> That's kind of weird. I don't know. Should I require attendance? Yes. Really? It's a but it's such a pain. But first of all, like no one ever required attendance when I was in college. It seems like high school to me. Yeah. And then, and then, but now we now we can get your recordings, so it's much easier to give class. Right, but not very many people are watching the recordings either. I know I can look at the statistics on YouTube. Some people watch, but not like yeah. Um, but you can like half require it. You can say it's like worth like a very small percentage of your grade. So like if people care about that percentage, it's hard to do for them. Then that makes it all the more of a pain, right? Is it like, you know, because so as soon as you require attendance, you have to actually have a way of taking attendance and then try to make sure that people aren't cheating on it by having their friend come and sign the thing or whatever. And then, you know, yeah. and then you have to like deal with all the excuses for why people couldn't be there and try to decide which excuses are legitimate. And... I had a class last quarter that said it required attendance and then they never checked that kind of work really people no. came just because <laughs> well at least at the start i don't know I mean, maybe maybe people were just going going to come to that class regardless i don't like have the request, but they did say that and then never oh. never checked one wow. all right anyway sorry we have to talk about it here again Maybe I should edit this part out of the recording. <laughs> All right. In any case, um, right. So I'm going on to talk about section five of the second inquiry. Um, and the, que the, the question in section five is why does social utility fees? I think that's actually the title of the second question, anyway, something like that. Why does so social utility please? Um, so, first of all, you might say, well, why is that a problem? Like, why do we need to know why social utility pleases? And Hume actually says, well, it's not really a problem. <laughs> this is. On page 39, he says, um, it is no just reason for rejecting any principle confirmed by experience that we cannot give a satisfactory account of its origin, nor are able to resolve it into other more general principles. Right, so he's saying, if we find by, ex by experience that people praise things because uh, they're socially useful. Uh, we, that is, people place characters and actions and people because they're useful to their society. Um, then we've answered that, that part of the question about, about the origin of morals. And um, it might be interesting to explain like why people praise that, but it's not necessary. We, we've, we've already done the job of learning that that's what they praise. Um, um, and again, in section nine, he comes back and says the same thing, right? That like, even if his explanation for principles, the, for the principles is rejected, the principles of themselves still stand. Um, so it's not really a problem, but it seems like a problem and I think that it seems like a problem, presumably because we have another principle in the back of our mind. And the principle in the back of our mind is that we really only approve of what is useful or immediately agreeable to ourselves. So, right, that contradicts all four of Hume's principles, the, the social utility one and, and, and the other three that we're not reading that part of the book, but the other three are 
I mean, it's basically, he summarizes it, he can summarize it in one sentence by saying, what is useful or agreeable, either to the person themselves or to others, but by others meaning their society, right? So, um, so those are all things that center around the person I'm judging, the person I'm deciding whether to praise or blame, no matter what their relationship, if any, is to me. And the principle we have in the back of our mind is that we only really approve of things that are agreeable or useful to ourselves. And so, like, um, 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 so that's why it seems like since we have that, we're, we're kind of assuming that principle. Remember, Locke uh, does hold that principle. Right? Everything I do is motivated by the desire to gain pleasure and avoid pain for myself. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so if we think that that must be the correct principle, then this answer seems weird and unaccountable. Why is it that we praise or blame these things um, based on something that has nothing to do with us? Um, now, of course, um, Locke has an answer to that. Sort of. um, well, maybe it's an maybe that's an answer to the question section nine question more than. No, I guess it belongs here. Like not Locke has an answer to that, which is that um, um, moral goodness is what will is always what will be more pleasant to me because God ensures that. <laughs> right. So um uh and but um this is one of the ways you can see that despite the fact that Hume now and then, much less than Hobbes, but now and then says something about God that makes it seem like, you know, uh, that he believes in God. This is one of the ways you can see why you would think he's really an atheist. Hume doesn't even mention that as a possible answer to this problem. He doesn't even consider it. So, um, right, so we have this question, like, why should I esteem what is useful to society, even to a society that has nothing to do with me, or is it war with my society? Um, and although, I mean, Hume could answer, again, he could answer, well, look, like, your principle is empirically false. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. Um, um, instead, what you would rather do is something much more complicated. Um, So, like, I guess, so there's there's kind of three parts to what he tries to show. The first one is what he shows in section five, which is um, to say, like, what about human nature? makes the selfish principle plausible but false. <laughs> right, that is, he wants to explain um, 
why this seems like a problem, but it really isn't. Um, so that involves taking on, like, take, directly taking on this alternative principle, explaining why it seems plausible to us, but explaining why it really isn't. Now, um, um, they, so the principle. Um, but then in section nine, he tries to do two farther things. So in the first part of section nine, um, he tries to show um, on the basis of what he's shown in section five, he tries to show like um, what makes moral esteem important? What makes it important and effective? That is like. Um, why it is given the explanation in section five that um, moral considerations can motivate us to act. Um, um, In a way, this, this question is actually more pressing, and the answer he gives in section five um, makes it harder to see how you're going to answer it. Right? So, the, like, the reason this question is more pressing is because, um, as I think I said last time, um, uh, apparently the purpose of moral blame and uh, praise is to get other people to act a certain way. Um, uh, it's supposed to be motivated. Um, so if we give an answer here that makes it seem like, um, well, yes, we can understand, okay, you know, we can understand why social virtue would, would um, draw some kind of approval from us. But it doesn't seem like that approval would be strong enough that it would make us want to ourselves be uh, virtuous. Um, when it's apparently against our interests. Um, so uh, that looks that looks like an objection to this theory. Right? Because it would, it would make it look like moral praise and blame, although. Um, we can explain why there's a sentiment there to be expressed by the words of moral praise and blame. Um, it seems like we would have no purpose for expressing it. So that's what he tries to answer in part one of section nine. And then in part, right, so this is section five, this is section nine, part one. And this is section nine, part two. At the end of section nine, he suddenly switches gears and he says, um, like, how can I recommend virtue? Right, that is the very thing that throughout the rest of the book he kept saying, that's not my business here. Suddenly at the end he says, oh wait, I better try to explain on the basis of my system how virtue can be recommended. So I guess, yeah. Going back and forth about this, I see that in my notes I wrote down that that it's actually here that Locke brings in God to answer the question, right? Like, 
Um, and I'm still not sure I agree with that. Maybe you've walked these God may answer all three of these questions. <laughs> um, but uh, um, In any case, leaving Locke aside, um, um, Hume, uh, when he, this is, this will be the surprise, when Hume turns to answer this question, he tries to answer it in terms of self-interest. Right, so like these parts, involves saying that we approve of things and can be motivated by things which independently of our self-interest. There's other motivations for praise and blame and for like approval, and there's other motivations for doing something besides self-interest. But then when he tries to say, so how can I recommend virtue based on my system? It, it, it comes down to how can I show that it's in your self-interest to be virtuous? So in other words, um, it seems like although the selfish theory isn't accurate about um, what we esteem and what motivates us, it is the only basis for rational recommendation. Um, Um, so, I mean, like one way of interpreting that would be to say, well, it's only um, self-interest is the only way something can be recommended, only basis on which something can be recommended in good faith. <laughs> like. I can persuade you to do it for other reasons, but if I'm, I'm actually trying to give advice for your own good, then that means I must base it on your interest and not on any other motivation. Um, um, I think actually when we talk, when I get to talk about this answer, we'll see that what Hume does is, um, a little bit more complicated. Um, um, I think what he what he actually he actually tries to like use that assumption about self interest to show that self interest isn't exactly what we thought it was. Um, so hopefully I'll get to those details when I, when I get back to that. Um, but okay, but the first thing I'm going to talk about is the answer to this question, which is probably the uh, easiest part time you can. Um, so, um, Right, so we're trying to answer this question, why does social utility sleep? Um, and he discusses three different answers. Um, so that, um, that is all three of these, um, Answers they're going to agree that social utility is a, is in fact a scheme, but they're going to disagree about why. So the first one he discusses is education. Um, education is 
the, the theory that the esteem for social utility arises from education is the theory that this esteem was created artificially by what, like what he calls politicians. That is, of course, meaning like not people who are running for office or something, but people who are like founding cities. <laughs> Hey, so uh, founding civil societies. And um, um, right, so this is the theory. All moral distinctions arise from education and were at first invented and afterwards encouraged by the art of politicians in order to render men tractable and subdue their natural ferocity and selfishness, which incapacitated them for society. So that's one theory that says basically that there's nothing inherent to human nature that would make social utility pleased, that we've been trained to be pleased by it. Um, the second one is deduction from self love. Right, so this would be, as I said, Hume's only answer is going to be along the lines of, this is why it seems like um, we couldn't possibly do this because aren't we only motivated by self-love? But the truth is we're not really only motivated by self-love and that's how we're going to explain why I do this. But this answer here is going to say that, um, well, look, obviously we are only motivated by self-love. And yet, on the other hand, yes, obviously we agree that we, agree, we, we approve of things that are socially useful. So how can that be? The answer must be that somehow we have reasons of self-interest to, appro to approve of things that are socially useful. Um, And the, you know, so like the way this is going to go is, um, I guess, fairly obvious. This is on page 40. It has often been asserted that as every man has a strong connection with society and perceives the impossibility of his solitary subsistence, he becomes on that account favorable to all those habits or principles which promote order in society and ensure to him the quiet possession of so inestimable a blessing. Um, right, so the, the answer to why we approve of social utility is because we realize that our interests are tied up with the interests of society. We can't survive on our own. And therefore we realize that, it's, that whatever promotes, whatever is socially useful is in our interests. And then there's kind of a subversion of this, which he discusses on page 41, which is um, that when you say, well, hold on a second, what if the society is a society in Athens thousands of years ago, or a society of people I'm at war with? So uh, how is my self-interest tied up with the good of that society? The answer is, well, we, tra we transport ourselves in imagining to that society and we, we like think of ourselves as being in that society and then that, if we were, then it would be in accord with our self-interest and that's why we agree with it. Um, and then finally, and this is the only answer, Humanity, that is, we have a tendency to be play, pleased with other people's pleasure, by other people's pleasure, and to, to suffer from other people's pain. So it's not true that we only approve of what's in our self interest. Of course, self interest is strong motivating. I don't think anyone would deny that, but, um, but, Hume says, but there's also a tendency to be like motivated by 
other people's pain and pleasure. And so obviously, if that's true, this problem becomes fairly easy to solve. So, like, I think Hume's big argument for this one is that um, really the burden of proof is on anything else. Or sometimes he seems to say something even stronger than that, that anything else is inconceivable. Um, I mean, the weaker form is on page 78. However difficult it be to conceive that an object is approved of on account of its tendency to a certain end, while the end itself is totally indifferent, right? So, like, if you don't, if you choose C, then you're saying, I'm saying, I approve of things that are, that make people happy, either the person who has them or the society that's around them. Um, but, um, but I don't care whether people are happy. So I approve of something because it's a means to a certain end, but I don't care about the end. And Hume says that's difficult to conceive. So like, um, the way I put it is the burden of proof would be on someone trying to claim something else. Right? If we like if we find people approving something, and the point is not just that um, it happens to be a means to that end, but we approve of it because we think it's a means to that end, right? Which his controlled experiments show, you know, like if our belief change, if our beliefs change, and we think we now think it's not socially useful, we stop approving it. So um, so it's clear that we approve of things that are socially useful and those other categories because they're an end to the happiness of other people. Um, and then, yeah, it's hard to see how that could be, could be true if we don't, in the first place, like take pleasure from other people being happy. Um, at one point, though, earlier on, he says something stronger than that. I'm not sure um, how seriously to take this. On page 43, usefulness is only a tendency to a certain end, and it is a contradiction in terms that anything pleases as means to an end. Where the end itself no wise affects us. I mean, why is that a contradiction in terms? But the other way around, right? This is what Kant says is analytic that if you approve, that if you um, approve of the end, you must approve of the means. Um, or approve is probably what he says there. If you will the end, you must will the means. Right? Sorry. Um, but the other way around, it seems like, I don't know, it would be strange, but is there a contradiction in terms? Anyway, uh, uh, he doesn't like so if like if it would really be a contradiction in terms then any other answer to this question is impossible right like once we've determined that things are approved as means to a certain end then the only possible explanation is that we approve that end and we can just dispose of these two um, uh, but it doesn't make that much difference because in fact that's not the strategy he takes right and says, but moreover, I'm going to offer detailed arguments against these two. So, um, so what are the arguments against these two? Okay. So what are the arguments against the other two? So against 
this one, the, his claim is that um, that could never be an original explanation for moral esteem. Um, yeah, this part becomes a little bit difficult to follow. Um, but I'm not presenting to the right on the board, maybe not. Um, so Hume admits that once the concept of virtue is in place, education can not only change it, but even give it entirely new objects. So objects inconsistent with his principles. Um, So, I mean, first of all, this is a little weird because this means that all of a sudden we're admitting that the induction that he carried out, you know, where he said, I'm going to look at all the examples of things that we praise or blame. Um, it turns out that there are exceptions. And, the ex you know, he has an explanation for the exceptions. The exceptions are artificially created by education. But still, there are exceptions. So the claim that I, you know, that this is just straightforward, I just collected all the things that we praise and blame, and now like you can test our theory against them. Um, it's not nearly that simple. And the exceptions are not necessarily that minor. Um, right, so, uh, The principle, this is a, again on page 39, this principle indeed of precept and education must so far be owned to have a powerful influence that it may frequently in, increase or diminish beyond their natural standard, the sentiments of approbation or dislike. and may even in particular instances create without any natural principle, a new sentiment of this kind, as is evident in all superstitious practices and observances. Right, so basically, like all religion is an exception. <laughs> I mean, by 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 using the term superstitious, um, Hume is like taking advantage of the fact that you know at least some of his readers will say, "Oh, but of course you don't mean true religion; you just mean superstition." Right, and especially you know, oh, you're probably thinking about those Catholics. Which, you know, which is what Locke would mean if he said it, I guess, right? Hume, you know, I think it's pretty clear he thinks all religions are superstitious, <laughs> right? The whole thing is superstition. <laughs> um, but in any case, even if you say, no, it's only, he's only thinking about the Catholics, I don't, I don't think that's right. But even if you say that, that's still, that's a pretty big exception, right? And if like, if you say, if you say well, I'm only talking about Catholics and Muslims and Jews and, you know, like anyone who has ritual practices um, that, uh, you know, who praises and blames things that don't at least seem to have any utility. Hume says, oh yeah, that's all due to education. So, um, I mean, I think in my mind that raises some question about about the stance he's taking as kind of like an objective empirical observer. Like, I mean, he's not really an anthropologist trying to determine like what factors in different human cultures make people approve or disagree with things. Um, he. Um, Begin with, he has something he wants to recommend. Um, and he's chosen a certain way of doing that. Um, and the way of doing it involves a kind of empirical investigation, but it's like, therefore, it's 
like I think understood for the outset that certain kind of things are not going to be explained, but are going to be um, regarded as perversions. Um, so, um, right, and later on he mentions celibacy, fasting, penance, and the whole train of monkish virtues. He says, they are everywhere rejected by men of sense. Although, I mean, he does have one thing to say, but is it true? He, he, this, this is the thing he has to say, which you might regard as a defense of, of, of ruling out these exceptions as, so to speak, outliers, right? Like data points that we don't need to consider, even though there's so many of them. <laughs> And this, I think this is what he has to say. A gloomy, harebrained enthusiast after his death may have a place in the calendar, but will scarcely ever be admitted when alive into intimacy and society. So, so far, this, if this is true, this sounds pretty good, right? He's saying that, yeah, like people claim that they praise these monkish virtues of celibacy and fasting and whatever. But when they actually meet someone who exhibits these virtues, they're like, well, I don't want to have that person over the dinner. <laughs> right? Um, so, like, maybe they don't, you know, their praise isn't sincere or whatever. Like, they only really praise it after the person is dead. <laughs> um, but then there's the last part of the sentence except by those who are as delirious and dismal as himself. <laughs> So, yeah, again, it turns out there may be a huge exception, right? Like the people who who are not, who don't like the company of the, of the paradigms of the monkish virtues are people who um, are men of good sense, which means they're people who are, they're not delirious and dismal, which means they're people like you. <laughs> um, people like Hume and people like what Hume wants to recommend. You be. Um, Okay, so anyway, I mean, that's just to worry about, like, you know, how his concession for this explanation seems to cause problems for other parts of his theory or for his method. But, um, but his answer to this is that, you know, so you might say, well, if education could do all of that, why couldn't it have created morals in the first place? It can create, because after all, he's conceded, it can create approval for things like that we have no natural tendency to approve. Um, so apparently, the answer to that is only given in section nine. Um, I mean, I mean, so like what he says here is just what he says. Uh, Yeah, so what he says here in section five, he just, he says, well, like, um, 
if there were no sentiment at all of this kind, politicians couldn't invent it out of nothing. But once there already is a sentiment of this kind, the the like um, priests or whatever can then direct it to new objects. But um, um, but uh, like he doesn't explain why. Um, and I guess I would say more fundamentally, he doesn't explain why we should even say that the priests are creating a new sentiment of this kind. Why not just say they're creating a completely new sentiment? Like, what makes it of this kind if it doesn't follow from these principles? Um, and, but, and then if you admitted that they're creating a completely new sen sentiment, then again, you'd be back with, well, why couldn't they have created this one just as well? Um, so, like, there must be some other way of saying what the sentiment must be like. Um, and that's what I think we only get in section nine. This is on the bottom of page 74. The notion of morals implies some sentiment common to all mankind, which recommends the same object to general approbation and makes every man or most men agree in the same opinion or decision concerning it. Um, I think that's that's the part of the science review. So right, so there he's saying that like what is a sentiment of this kind? It's a sentiment that um it's something that everyone can agree on approving or disapproving of. And by everyone can agree, I mean, like, so um, everyone can agree to approve of food because everyone needs food, right? But that's not the kind of agreement we're talking about here because when when I say I approve of food, I mean I approve of food for me. <laughs> you, everyone approves of food for themselves, <laughs> right? But this has to be something that everyone approves of without regard to its relation to, to them. So, um, uh, so first of all, it turns out that like it was maybe kind of by the definition of moral sentiment. The answer would have to be that the origin would have to be something like this. Um, uh, whether it could be explained by self-interest or not, like you would have to pass through this this um, stage of something that everyone can approve of together. Um, this is, you know, I mean, this is exactly how Hobbes um, Introduces the moral law to the to the to the state of nature in Leviathan, right? He's you know he says like um, that in general there's nothing that everyone calls good because you know what's good for me is uh, is bad for you, and in the state of nature almost necessarily right because we all have rights to everything and you know we're all afraid of each other and you know so right so um but Hobbes says well but there's one thing I think exactly one thing that we all can agree to call good and that is peace <laughs> right and so therefore according to Hobbes the first law of nature is seek peace um so um um, so it's like Hume is saying that um, so first of all, like that's an example of production from self-love, right? The way Hobbes does it. He's saying that there's one case where everyone's self-interest agrees. Everyone's self-interest agrees that we should leave the state of nature, which is you know, nasty, miserable, and short, whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, so that's the one thing where, like, everyone can agree to outvote anyone who dissents from it. Because you know, it's, 
in everyone's self-interest. Um, you know, this will be like, like you know, among other things, like Hume has pretty strong criticisms of of social contract theory in general. But but like one of the things he's we would be able to say against that is okay, but why do we approve of peace in some society that has nothing to do with us or even that's at war with us? Right. So Hobbes can't explain that. Um, but in any case, um, the, the point is, if, so if there is an explanation of that from self-interest, there has to be some other explanation of how we end up with a sentiment such that there's something we can all agree on, on praising or blaming. Um, And I think the point is that, um, like, so once we have an idea, a word that means that everyone should praise or blame this, we can be educated to apply it to new cases. But if we had no such sentiment at all, we wouldn't understand that word. Um, Right, so when the politician tries to get us to regard a certain character as odious, that is to be hated, right? And says, you know, um, oh, isn't this uh, character to be, oh, I don't know exactly how the politician is educating us. So let's see. Is it by educating children? Is it by convincing us that Zeus is gonna strike it down with a lightning bolt? Um, I don't know, but anyway, somehow the, the politician is trying to get us to think of a certain character as odious. Um, we're going to say that is to be hated, and we're going to say hated by whom? <laughs> right? Like it won't seem like that makes sense without adding, if we don't already have that sentiment, it won't seem like that makes sense unless you add the the person to whom it's supposed to be hated. So we must already, before the politician gets started, understand the idea of something being hateful, no matter who you are. I, th I think that's the argument. I'm not sure that argument is so strong, but, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's the best interpretation I can. Maybe it is. Hard to say. Um, but in any case, that's the, that's the best interpretation I can give what he says about politicians not being able to invent this out of nothing. Um, and as for this one, as I, as I said, you know, like the main... The main version of it is going to be opposed just by the usual argument of saying, well, but, you know, um, we praise and blame things that are in societies that have nothing to do with us. Um, or I think he's, he thinks it's especially clear in the case of, which he also thinks is especially hard to deny, that we praise and blame certain things, characteristics, because they're useful to the person themselves who has them. Right, so like prudence, temperance, industry, whatever, right? Like um, he, he thinks it's pretty clear that we approve of those things, that we regard that as those as praises when we say them about someone. Um, and um, no deduction from self-interest is conceivable in that case. Right, talking about something that's directly useful to someone else. <laughs> um, so, uh, and as for the subversion that says, well, I imagine being that person or being in that person's society, Hume says, um, it is not conceivable, this is on page 41, it is not conceivable how a real sentiment or passion can ever arise from a known imaginary interest, especially when our real interest is still kept in view and is often acknowledged to be entirely distinct from the imaginary and even sometimes opposite to it. 
right? So like he's not denying that you can sometimes um, that sentiments can be aroused by imagination. But he's saying those sentiments aren't going to have, they aren't going to have the vivacity that comes from attachment to a present impression, right? They're not going to be real sentiments. Um, and especially when the real sent, when there is a real sentiment, then it goes in the opposite direction. So, like, we like begrudgingly have, you know, we acknowledge that the um, enemy's champion is courageous. Um, or if we can't bring them, ourselves to do that, then, um, as he says in another place, we don't, um, we try to make up a story about why they're really not courageous. Right? So, um, um, that is, we still aren't willing to say, I just disapprove of them because they're bad for me. <laughs> Even if that's the real motivation, we're like, we have such a hard time um, asserting that as the basis for praise and blame, that we instead invent a story about why our enemy isn't really courageous. Um, so, um, Right, so, so again, that, that shows that like we're not really imagining ourselves to be them. We know who we are. <laughs> we know they're not us, and we still approve of it. Um, now, like, I mean, again, I don't know, I don't know if any of these, I mean, well, okay, I should say, I know for sure that none of these arguments are open and shut. <laughs> it's not like you, like prove the right theory of morals and now we're done. <laughs> um, but um, uh, but I you know I can think of ways of objecting to that but um, but you know at least on the surface it's a pretty strong argument. How can this imagine are you, you have a question? Yeah. I kind of have a question. Okay. Um I, I guess I'm just confused like why it needs to like why it's self-love and not like because it seems like this is just like self-reflection like can you say more about that i'm not sure well like what about like this process where the per like you know because we're talking about like well I, I guess i just don't understand like where the where like why is it self-love where is the love like because it seems like if you're praising or blaming it's not necessarily coming like it's not like a like a it's more of like a reflection than it is like well if you're praising someone if you're approving of them um, you're taking pleasure from them being the way they are uh, you're um, um, as I said, also presumably trying to get other people to be that way. Um, so it seems like you have an interest in them being that way. Like you want them to be that way. And you want people in general to be that way. Um, I mean, okay. So, so that, that, that's the love part, right? I mean, love here doesn't, obviously, it doesn't mean like, you know, like sending a Valentine's card or something, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, uh, but it means like desiring, uh, having it, taking an interest in something. Right, so, and so like deduction from self-love would be, again, that like, um, um, but, so in the case of the ver of the characteristics that are useful to the person who has them, it seems impossible to do that directly. Right? Like you know, like how could I possibly always have an interest in other people having characteristics that are useful to them? So, um, 
But but so that's why, like at least in that case, it seems like you have to try this thing about imagination. And then you would say, well, what happens is that I momentarily imagine that I'm them. And as them, I improve mm -hmm. having this characteristic because it's useful to me. Um, and because and you know, and because I'm I I have self-love, but now in my imagination, my self-love is, is love for them, not for me. <laughs> That's why I approve it. But he's saying that, you know, like imagination is not um, hallucination, <laughs> right? I mean, it's not like you literally think you're someone else. Um, so it couldn't possibly cause this uh, like desire for the person to be that way when you know they're not really you. Um, Uh, right, so that's the argument. I mean, I guess, you know, and you know, he might say, he doesn't tell the sin, but I think, you know, he might say, like, what it actually would cause is a desire for me to be that way, right? Like, I imagine being that other person, and I imagine being so happy that I have this characteristic, and that's not going to make me want the other person to have the characteristic. It's going to make me, me want to have the characteristic, or want me to have the characteristic. Um, so, um, right, so, um, so now he's ruled out this one of them. So only this one is left. Um, but he also provides a, a positive argument for this one, um, which consists mostly of, um, examples that show that there is like this principle of humanity. Um, examples from outside the sphere of morality. Right, like so for example, I mean, not all these examples are so convincing or maybe some of them are convincing to his audience and not to us. Like, um, he says, how everyone prefers pastoral poetry, which is like poetry about like shepherds and shepherdesses in the field, like, I don't know, like playing music and chasing each other or <laughs> frolicking around <laughs> um, and how happy they are. Everyone prefers that to poetry that involves toil, labor, and danger, right? So that so the, this whatever poet who decided to write uh, something like a pastoral, but they set it by the seashore with fishermen instead of in the fields with shepherds. And he says that was a mistake because no one likes to read about toil and danger. That that seems kind of wrong. <laughs> um, I mean, was it true then? Yeah. Yes. But like a more serious example, but this also you might worry about. Well, or, so is the famous Gaudi pose example. Right, so he says, um, you know, suppose there you, um, um, there's someone you don't know and they have gout, which means their feet are very, very painful and you have a choice between stepping on the sidewalk or stepping on their gouty toes. And he says, wouldn't anyone in that situation step on the sidewalk and not on the gouty toe? So, um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't step on the gouty toes, but, uh, and again, I'm not sure, has this changed? Like maybe we're worse now than people used to be. I mean, this is related to something, I think I was talking about in the other course about Thoreau saying that um, wow. he didn't need a lock for his house because there was nothing in it worth stealing. 
And even when he went away for two weeks to his trip to Maine or whatever, he didn't lock the door and nothing ever happened to his house. So, in, you know, his house was like a mile from Concord. You know, it wasn't really out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, if you like, if you built a house like within a mile of a town now and you just left it with no lock on the door, I think even if there was nothing in it to steal, it would probably be vandalized. Um, so are we worried? <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, um, um, you know, I mean, maybe like our society is just so weird that, that we shouldn't expect good general explanations to apply to our society. Uh, so, uh, but in any case, um, that that com I guess that completes the you know he has this first of all he has that argument that that you should assume that if we approve of the means, it must be because we approve of the end. Then he has the negative arguments in these two, and then he has examples to try to show that there is some principle of humanity in us. Um, and that concludes the answer to that first question, right? Except, I guess I should say one other thing about it, which is those examples that he gives are carefully chosen to be examples where nothing else is at stake, right? So it's either a fictional world that I'm reading about in a poem, um, or it's someone who I have no relationship with, never going to see them again, you know, because he admits that if, like, if there were reasons of envy or um, revenge or anything like that, then um, then, yeah, there's no telling whether I'd step on the sidewalk or the, or the toes, right? So, um, so like, and that's why I say this, this answer, like, at the same time as it explains or, like, tries to prove that we have this principle of humanity, and that explains why social utility pleases, um, also ends up conceding that this principle of humanity may be extremely weak. It only comes into play when um, when we don't have motives, strong motives of self-interest. So. Um, So this is a footnote on page 52. So this is in section six, which wasn't part of the assigned reading, but um, one may venture to affirm that there is no human creature to whom it's it's footnote 26 on page 52. One may venture to affirm that there is no human creature to whom the appearance of happiness parentheses, where envy or revenge has no place, does not give pleasure, that of misery, uneasiness. This seems inseparable from our making constitution, but they are only the more generous minds that are thence prompted to seek zealously the good of others and to have a real passion for their welfare. With men of narrow and ungenerous spirits, this sympathy goes not beyond a slight feeling of the imagination, which serves only to excite sentiments of complacency or censure, it makes them apply to the object either honorable or dishonorable appellations. And then he gives the example of a miser who, um, and are there still misers? No, no. Like, the miser is like a common character in all these moral philosophers, but I don't know if it's like, is a, is a hoard, like, we have hoarders, do we have misers? No, that's Anyway, there used to be a lot of misers, I guess. And uh, the miser, he says, approves of um, the virtues of 
uh, thrift and, and or industry and frugality, even in others. Um, uh, so, like, it feels a, 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 a sentiment of esteem towards someone who's industrious and frugal. Um, but, um, um, wouldn't be willing to part with a shilling for like, to uh, make the fortune of the person he's braving, <laughs> right? So the like the only result of the tendency of humanity in the case of the miser is to um, feel this this slight sentiment of approval, but it's not moving the miser to do anything at all. Um, and, you know, uh, he, he, he says this about, uh, um, he says this about this, this sentiment in a lot of places and except page 74, he says it may be too weak to move a finger. Right. So that's why I think this this answer to the question leads into that other question I was uh, that I that I said is addressed in part one of section nine, namely, okay, if that's why we approve of social utilities, because we have this really weak tendency, then um, why make such a big deal about it? Right, like praising someone as more as virtuous um, is going to give people only the, the very weakest tendency to be that way. Um, So, um, so Hume's answer to this first starts with um, the fact that um, with what I was saying before about the nature of um, what we approve of here, what we approve of morally as being different from the nature of everything else we approve of because everyone can agree on it. Um, so, um, So he actually starts saying this towards the end of section five. The first step here is that um, these moral characteristics are the ones that are um, useful to talk to each other about. Um, so he compares it to the way we talk about um, size of objects, for example. So, like, um, um, the size that we immediately experience is such that the objects that are closer to us are much bigger. <laughs> Um, if you think back to his theory of space and time in a treatise, at least you could say, I mean, uh, they are bigger, <laughs> right? Like the, um, I mean, at least our representations of them are bigger. But then, but then you have to remember that that section on space and time was written from the 
point of view, from the philosophical point of view that distinguishes between the idea and its objects. Whereas he says, in ordinary life, we don't make that distinction. Right? So, like, so in ordinary life, like, we think the impression of the table is the table. And of course, the impression of the table, that is what we think is the table, is gets bigger when I get closer to it and gets smaller when I get farther away from it. So, um, um, but um, he says that view of the size of the table is not useful. It's not useful for communication with others. It's not even useful for my own thoughts because it's constantly changing. Um, like what I want to remember about the table, what's useful for me to tell you about the table has to be something that is independent of my particular point of view at this time. So that's why he says in the case of like describing the size of objects, we, um, we discover um, and adopt words for like that aspect. It's a little hard to put this into words, but it's like that aspect of the size that's constant. I mean, it's, um, Um, so and the reason I like um, what's constant is what is really constant. What's constant is like the relationship between the distance and the size of the table. Right? Like you know, when I'm this close, it's this big. When I'm this close, it's this big. Right? So I mean, that can be summarized. You, you can like you can understand that either as just a function that you need a word to stand for or you can think of it as the table from like as seen from some standard distance um, like he doesn't say enough about how he thinks this works to distinguish between those two I and mean, they're they're equivalent to each other right but um, but in any case um, in some way or other, so like our 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 terminology for describing of the size of the objects um, all refers to that constant size and not to the size that we actually can see. Um, and like again, the the reason is that even though uh, the size that I actually perceive is what's like at this moment is necessary for me to know. Um, it's not useful um, to remember that or to tell someone else that. What's useful, like if you know, if I know at this moment that the table is such and such size, meaning it has such and such minimal visible parts. <laughs> Of course, we can't really count them. That's another aspect of this, but never mind that. So I know at this moment the table has such and such size. Um, what's going to be useful to for me to remember about the table tomorrow when I come back tomorrow? Not like how big it looked at that moment, because I may not be standing at the same distance from it tomorrow. Rather, like that that function or that size at a at a at a standard distance. It will allow me to predict how it's going to look no matter how I'm standing, right? So, like, so this, so, so the, the point is that um, we adopt ways of thinking and talking that um, convey something that's um, neutral with respect to the particular perspective. Yeah. Um, so, like, in other words, could you say, like, the constant would be uh, size in relation to distance? Yeah, that's why, like, well, one way I was understanding was that, like a function, right? Size is a function of distance. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if that concept of function is is even something that, that is available to you. Um, but, uh, um, 
But anyway, yeah, that would be one way to understand it as a you know a function that assigns different distance, different sizes, different distances. But like I said, you could also understand it. So like, for example, this is how the absolute magnitude of stars is defined. The absolute magnitude of a star is the magnitude it would have at some um, constant distance. I, I don't know what the distance is, maybe one parsec or something like that, right? So, um, um, right, so you could define the size of the table as the size of the table from three feet away. I mean, of course, in the case of a table, it also you know it changes its shape when you move around. I'm like forget about all that. All right, so um, maybe the stars actually would be a better better example. The only thing we see is how bright it is. Um, so um, um, so similarly in this case, Hume says. That like if I want to convey sentiments of approval or disapproval to you, or I guess even to myself tomorrow, it like, doesn't emphasize that part, but it seems like um, by parallelism with the with his other example, that would you would have to say that here too. That if I want to convey sentiments of approval and disapproval in a way that's useful. Um, I have to like find some kind of constant aspect of it we can all agree on. Um, and that will be the useful thing to tell you. Right, so it's like originally the need for language actually is what is, is um, is what starts what? It doesn't generate this sentiment. Sentiment is always there. But it's what first starts to call attention to this sentiment and single it out from others, even though it's weaker. It's weaker, but it's something that's you it's something that's useful to have words about. Now, of course, I mean we do also have words like painful. <laughs> Right, that are that are not objective in this way. Um, so, whereas I guess without long circular equations, we don't really have words for the apparent size of things, right? Like you never say. Um, I mean, what you would have to say is what angle it's of or something. You know? I mean, uh, but you know, we don't say that in. in in everyday life, right? But we, we do oftentimes say things like, ow, oh, that hurts. <laughs> um, so maybe the parallel isn't that exact. Um, but in any case, um, but uh, there seems to be something to it. So, um, I mean, you know, what he says about this is like having, having words like this to single out this sentiment um, is quote unquote useful for our purposes. So it's actually like this step is taken under the direction of self interest. Right? Like it's useful for my purposes to have words about praise and blame that you'll understand. Or that you'll have a reason to care about, I guess, maybe is a better way to put it. Right? So if the only words I have are the ones that um, are from my point of view, right? Like th this is what Hobbes and Locke both think the word good is like. Right? They say that good really means, um, you know, either pleasant or useful to me. Um, if that were really the only kind of words I had to express praise, uh, approval or disapproval of something, then anything I could say with those words in general, you wouldn't care about. So you would have no reason to listen to me. Um, so if I want to say things to you that you will care about, I have to, you know, like, find something that we can agree on and invent words to, to refer to that. 
Um, so it's like this theme isn't due to self interest, but um, oh. But the praise is due to self interest. <laughs> Right, I mean, that is what makes it crazy worthy is a basis for a theme that has nothing to do with self-interest, my humanity. But when I actually come to praise it, it's, it's you know, like that's for my own purposes. Um, uh, Um, so we still haven't answered this question, and that's why I say, like, so this is at the end of section five, what I was talking about. We So this still hasn't really answered the question, what motivates us to actually be moral? Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, I guess there's two things to say about that. Like, number one, I guess you could say empirically, we simply, we seem to have some motive to be moral. There seem to be examples of people doing things because they're virtuous or avoiding things because they're virtuous. Um, uh, moreover, like this kind of moral play praise for it to really be useful for my purposes, it ought to motivate people somehow. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll understand what I'm saying, but you still won't care about it. Thank you. Um, so, uh, um, so that's why in part one of section nine, he tries to explain how starting from the right, so we now have two starting places. Number one, we have this sentiment, which in and of itself is pretty weak, but it's there. And number two, we've drawn attention to the fact that this is the sentiment that even though it's kind of weak, everyone can agree on. And then he says, um, once that happens, there's certain forces that tend to amplify these things. I mean, I think there's basically two. One of them is um, mob feelings, <laughs> basically. Right? That if you notice that a whole bunch of people all approve of something, that tends to make you want to approve. Right, and he says this is what causes factionalism in cities, and you know why uh, when Solon wanted to promise to, to punish people who took neither side in the civil war, he says that may be a harsh law, but it wasn't. I mean, sorry, that may be a um, strange law, but it wasn't very harsh because how many new, how many people are ever neutral in a civil war? Hey, like once it gets started, everyone gets involved in one party or the other. And he says, um, similarly in this case, but even more, these principles we must remark are social and universal. They form in a manner the party of humankind against vice or disorder as common enemy. Right? So like at first this sentiment is weak and it doesn't motivate it to do anything, but then we develop this language to talk about it. And then we start to notice that, um, that you know, hey, everyone seems to agree with this, to approve of it. And that makes us want to go along. <laughs> um, Um, and the other reason he gives is why these sentiments get amplified. I think maybe this is like a, I, I guess, 
No, they just say the second step. It's just another reason. Love of fame, right? So a sentiment that we have that is pretty strong is that we want other people to approve of us. Um, so like, um, now we, we set aside and call attention to the characteristics that will get everyone to approve of you, even if somewhat weakly. So, um, so we start constantly like checking ourselves as if we were someone else to make sure that we're displaying those characteristics. Yeah. Is that one still true? Or do we now just try and give the impression that we're displaying those? Well, I, I mean, I think he's not saying that we don't often just try to get the impression. Okay. Right? I mean, I think obviously we do often just try to get the impression, but he's still he's trying to explain why. I mean, look, he's not trying to explain why we're always motivated by morality or even usually motivated by morality, because clearly we're not always motivated by morality, and it's not clear how 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 common it is, right? But it seems like we're sometimes motivated by it, and we think other people might be motivated by it. So we try to explain why it has more force than just this tiny weak thing, right? And so, you know, so again, so one of the reasons is we, we tend to get caught up in it. And the other reason is that we get in the habit of judging ourselves by its by its standard because we, we want other people to approve of us. Um, this is you know, this is similar to what Hume's. Brad Adam Smith said, obviously not by coincidence, yeah. about the, the internal spectator, right? The theory of moral sentiments. Um, that uh, uh, and do we still do that? Yeah, I think we do. It's it's you know. I mean, is this the reason why we do it? I don't know, but like it is painful to. It's disturbing to think that even if no one knows, it's disturbing to think that people would disapprove of what you're doing if they knew. Um, so there is some motivation there and sometimes strong enough to, to make you at least move a finger, right? Um, so, um, However, the thing about both of those explanations are that they don't seem very rational, right? I mean, this mob feeling, uh, in general, it's something you should avoid. Um, once you see that that's the explanation, is that, isn't that gonna weaken your desire to be moral? And I think, you know, similarly for the other one where you suddenly realize that, the, that you've just got in the habit of um, judging yourself as, you know, from someone else's point of view. Um, and uh, um, of course, from their point of view, they would approve you being moral. Um, but uh, uh, but their point of view isn't really your point of view. So in this case, I mean, it would be interesting to try to figure out what's different this case between this case and the other case. Why imagination can do this and not the other thing? Um, I, I think you could probably say, but I'm not going to try to because there's very little time left. <laughs> Um, so it seems like like once you realize that, you would um, you would have a tendency to to weaken moral motivation. You said that's why I was doing it. And remember that Hume says um, in that um, passage I read before that education quote, may frequently increase 
or diminish beyond the natural standard the sentiments of approbation or dislike. Ray, like education could be dangerous. It might diminish your sentiment. So this is, I think, is what leads into the beginning of section nine, part two. Right, with, with, without explaining exactly why this has come up now at this point, um, I think the, 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 the need to discuss the question, can I recommend virtue based on this system, has come up because what he just said seems to go in the opposite direction. Seems to, seems to show that his system will tend to diminish the morality of people who understand and agree with them. And as he says at the beginning of part two of section nine, um, um, Yeah. Um, what, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with it is that um, it's going to be bad for his book. <laughs> right? That's what he says. Um, Though the philosophical truth of any proposition by no means depends on its tendency to promote the interests of society. Yet a man has but a bad grace who delivers a theory, however true, which he must confess leads to a practice dangerous and pernicious. Now, I mean, so far, like that, that argument depends on approving of social utility. Hey. Like uh, saying, you know, it would be bad to publish um, a, a theory that weakens, um, that's, that's bad for the public because it doesn't have social utility, right? And I mean, so like on the one hand, obviously if um, virtue is largely based on social utility and your theory is gonna make people um, reject that as a, as a motive, then your theory is going to be bad for the public, <laughs> right? It has social utility, um, but uh, why should you care? Because like, if you yourself start to not care about social utility, then you should be like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> but th that's why I think what's important is the end of the paragraph. The ingenuity of your researches may be admired, but your systems will be detested. And mankind will agree if they cannot refute them to sink them at least in eternal silence and oblivion. Truths which are pernicious to society, if any such they re there be, will yield to errors which are salutary and advantageous. So that's why, at the beginning of section nine, he's, he tries to explain how he can recommend virtue based on this system, because otherwise, Mankind will agree to consign his book to eternal sense and oblivion. Now, I mean, obviously, when you say that, we're on tricky ground, right? Because he's given us a reason to, like, he, he's explained why he would want to convince the public at large that his system is not socially pernicious. Um, but for that, it's not necessary that the argument be valid. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, oops, I'm basically out of time. <laughs> um, What he says about it is this, and it's really weird, but it may be something that, it may be an argument that he's not serious about, but that seems serious to talk. So I'll just say what it is, which is 
Um, so he says, suppose you have to, and I say it seems curious, the con not that Kant agrees with this argument, but the argument is this. Um, suppose you have to choose, so first of all, he says, what is self-interest? Self-interest is getting the things that you cause you pleasure. But what causes you pleasure, right? So that has to be determined independently of self-interest. So he says, suppose you have the ability to choose which things will cause you pleasure, which one would you choose? And then he tries to claim that um, that like humanity and benevolence is a like is a like good way to get pleasure, meaning you'll get more pleasure that way. <laughs> and so if you could, you would choose that. I mean, um, it's a weird argument because you can't choose what things are going to give you pleasure. So how what way of what kind of way of recommending something? <laughs> right, as, as he himself said, people will tell you, um, well, yeah, I would like to be virtuous, but like, <laughs> I would like to have my, my desires go in the direction of virtue, but they don't. <laughs> um, so uh, it's not clear at what point we leave that, and um, I can't keep you hurt <laughs> anymore, so I will end the course here. <laughs> Thank you all for. Um, for sticking with it, <laughs> all, all who are here, and have a good summer. Thank you.